Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here today. So welcome to the virtual Zoom Science Cafe. The usual facilitator, Pamela Wolf, is unable to be here today. So I am very pleased to host today's session. Uh, Science Cafe was founded in 2008 to give Carleton faculty and science, uh, faculty of science um, an innovative opportunity to, to share the research, or research that was happening on campus. Um, and we also know that many people who are tuning in today are supporters of this research. Um, so again, we thank you for being here today. Uh, my name is Francine Derrick. I am a faculty member in health sciences, and I'm very pleased to introduce today's presenter and one of my fabulous grad students, Elia Palladino. Uh, Elia graduated with a Bachelor of Health Sciences, um, an honors degree at Carleton University, and she is currently pursuing and wrapping up her Master of Science in Health Science Technology and Policy. So as a member of the Health and Wellness Equity Research Group at Carleton, she's conducting research to guide the development of a landscape of practice that will positively impact the sustainability of community developed and implemented physical activity programs and resources for marginalized populations. Uh, so I will stop speaking now and I will turn the session over to Elia but just um, a quick reminder, we have um, a question and answer panel at the end. So feel free to enter your questions as they come up. Um, and I will share those questions with Elia at the end of the presentation. So Elia, take it away whenever you are ready. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Elia Palladino, and as Francine mentioned, I am a second year Master's of Science student in the Health and Wellness Equity Research Group at Carleton University. I would like to thank Jesse Cartwright for inviting me to present today and my supervisor, Dr. Francine Derrick, for the introduction. So while perusing through the online advertisement for today's Science Cafe, I'm sure many of you were wondering, what is the landscape of practice? What is trauma and violence informed? And how does it all fit together with physical activity? Well, today I plan to describe each of these pieces and show you how they will all come together. I would also like to mention that this presentation will discuss topics such as trauma and violence that may be potentially triggering to some people. Please feel free to step away from this presentation at any time. I would like to acknowledge that the land I live, work, and play on is the unceded traditional territories of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation. Physical activity is any movement of the body that expends energy. Everyday activities such as walking up the stairs or walking to the community mailbox are a form of physical activity. On the other hand, leisure time physical activity is completed in addition to everyday activities that get the body moving. This includes, but is not limited to, swimming, dancing, and practicing yoga. As the physical and mental health benefits of physical activity are plentiful, national and international organizations, including the Government of Canada and the World Health Organization, encourage and recommend daily physical activity for all age groups. Physical activity has even been identified as a strategy for improving social and community cohesion. However, leisure time physical activity is not always accessible to everyone, nor does it meet the needs of all individuals. People living in marginalizing conditions, such as domestic and sexual violence, unsafe or unstable housing, experiences of trauma, are at risk of physical inactivity due to barriers to access and participation. These barriers can include availability of childcare, workout clothes, transportation to and from the workout facility. So in the previous slide, I emphasize that individuals who have lived and living experience of trauma are at risk of physical inactivity. But what is trauma? 
Defining trauma can be quite challenging as everyone conceptualizes trauma differently. The government of Canada defines trauma as both the experience of and response to an overwhelmingly negative event or series of events, including violence. When we're talking about trauma, we are talking about the collection of negative experiences, which may be one incident like shock or a car accident, or we may be talking about the multi-generational impacts of abuse like in residential schools. Trauma looks and feels different to different people, but it changes the way our brain and body allow us to feel safe. Like trauma, violence can take on many forms, including physical, emotional, and systemic violence. This past year, we have all experienced a traumatic event, the COVID-19 pandemic. While people's experience of the COVID-19 pandemic is different and depends on their intersecting factors, there is a collective sense of stress, fear, uncertainty, and anxiety. In addition, individuals may have experienced or witnessed increased forms of violence, including family violence and maltreatment. As a result of the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on daily life, individuals have had to adjust and have developed all sorts of coping mechanisms. Uptake of physical activity is a coping mechanism being promoted for its physical and mental health benefits. Experiences of trauma and violence have been linked to poor health outcomes and behaviors with short and lifelong impacts. Trauma and violence can impact the brain, and depending on the timing of exposure, changes in rewiring of the brain can occur. I think it's important to highlight the connection between trauma and the stress response. So I'll do so by walking you through an example. Trauma exposure or multiple exposures leads to a stress response. For example, a car accident triggers the stress system to help an individual get out of the car. To create the stress response, the brain increases the activity of the stress axis. This axis is a major part of the stress response, and one of the ways it works is by increasing the levels of cortisol, a stress hormone. So when cortisol is released, the body gets ready to respond to the threat that has been sensed. In this case, the threat is the physical harm caused by the collision of the cars. The priority at this stage is survival. So the body is really trying to give you all the energy one needs to focus on escaping or fighting off a threat that is being sensed. Once an individual gets out of the car, the stress access activity and cortisol levels are high, but the body doesn't need that extra energy boost anymore because the individual is safe and away from danger. So the body needs to stop the stress response. To do that, the body uses what's called a negative feedback loop. This is where the cortisol that's being released actually stops its own production. So this stress hormone helps us to respond to the stress and at the same time, it's trying to stop the stress response once we don't need all that extra energy anymore. The priority at this stage is overcoming the stress response. Because while the individual has been trying to escape that dangerous or traumatic situation, the body has redirected its energy away from things such as our immune system and digestive system. And those are still things that we need to work. So once an individual is in a safe place, the body wants to let those systems start functioning normally again. But when there are long-term impacts of trauma, that normal increase in negative feedback activity becomes really exaggerated. So that exaggerated negative feedback can lead to lower levels of stress access activity and lower resting levels of cortisol. These lower levels make it difficult to mount a stress response the next time an individual experiences a traumatic event. Okay. So now that we are all experts on how the brain is impacted by experiences of trauma, you may be wondering, how does trauma impact the body? You may also be wondering, what does this have to do with physical activity? 
So the idea is that when an individual is exposed to traumatic events, such as a car accident in our previous example, the body also responds. And this can lead to negative biological, psychological, and social outcomes, such as increased negative stress. In the long term, for some people, that trauma exposure can become replaced by other triggers or sensations, including physical activity and exercise. While impacts on the stress response system vary, these changes to the stress response system can make exercising feel a lot less accessible and very challenging. The idea is that trauma can become embodied. So the trauma lives within the body and it influences an individual's actions, thoughts, and movements. This can often lead to disruptions in the connection between the body and the brain. If the body keeps trying to prepare to fight off a threat that isn't there, over time, it can become hard to feel truly comfortable and safe in one's own body. It can be hard to trust the signal the body sends. When exercising, an individual may experience increased negative stress, like increased heart rate or heavy breathing, which can remind them of their traumatic or traumatic events. Even though these are normal parts of exercising, it may be triggering to someone impacted by trauma. These can be major barriers to engagement and participation in physical activity. Because of this, it is important to create spaces where people are comfortable and where people might be able to, in a way, unlearn these associations between physical sensations and exercise. And that's where trauma and violence informed physical activity comes in. So what is trauma and violence informed physical activity? I recognize that this topic may be new to some of you and that you've also been listening to me talk for the past nine slides. So I would like to show you an animated video that my colleagues and I co-authored and co-created, which gives an overview of trauma and violence informed physical activity. For many of us, when we think of physical activity, we often picture going out for a bike ride, heading to soccer practice, joining a Pilates class, or spending the day in the garden. We're often told to do it because it's good for stress management and overall health. But what we often don't consider are the marginalizing circumstances, such as racism, living in poverty, experiences of domestic and structural violence, histories of trauma, or substance use stigma, which can create barriers to people accessing and participating in physical activity. The reality is that accessibility to physical activity is significantly impacted by the social, economic, emotional, and physical environments in which we live. When these factors aren't addressed, it can seriously impact participation. Recognizing and acknowledging these barriers is the first step to promoting equitable access to physical activity. That means addressing obstacles individuals face due to gender discrimination, heterosexism, racism, socioeconomic disadvantage and poverty stigma, and barriers to education. Trauma and Violence-Informed Physical Activity, or TVIPA, is one approach to reducing these barriers and improving access to physical activity resources. TVIPA is a powerful practice that recognizes the beneficial effects of physical activity for the psychological health, physical health, and overall well-being of people living in marginalizing circumstances. TVIPA establishes supportive environments where participants can build positive relationships with physical and social engagement. TVIPA also brings awareness to the widespread effects of marginalization, trauma, and violence, with roughly 70% of adults experiencing at least one traumatic event in their lifetime, such as intimate partner violence, adverse childhood events, emotional abuse, and sexual abuse. So, how can we reimagine physical activity environments through a trauma and violence-informed lens to create safe, non-violent environments in which individuals can feel empowered to make choices, collaborate, and learn. 
ensure all staff are aware of the widespread impact of trauma and how it can affect the emotions and behaviors of people or groups. Have community members co-create and co-lead programming. Offer free or affordable programming. Make plans for sustainable and consistent programs. Provide activity variations to support all levels of abilities. Use non-controlling language, offering options such as, if you're comfortable, use invitational language and encourage people to make individual choices and to listen to their bodies. Use diverse images in physical spaces and advertising. Be flexible with timing, allowing individuals to join programming at any point. Offer self-identified women-only classes. Offer child care. Offer snacks and food support. Offer gender-neutral bathrooms. Celebrate people for making the effort to show up. When possible, ensure participants have the gear required to take part, such as running shoes, sports bras, water bottles. By starting to break down the barriers to participating in physical activity, we can begin to rethink the best ways to address obstacles and create equitable opportunities for all individuals to achieve positive health outcomes and lead healthy lives. So you may be thinking, why physical activity? While this continues to be researched, as of right now, we think that exercise may be one way to help the body return to its regulated state after the stress response created from traumatic events. One idea is that physical activity invites an individual to be present in the body and having control over it. It allows an individual to be present in the moment and keeps them there. So, so far, we have broken down more than three quarters of the title. We have reviewed the basics of physical activity and its importance to physical and mental health. We emphasize that physical activity is not always accessible, nor does it meet the needs of all individuals. We have discussed the concept of trauma and violence. Work through an example to show how the experience or living experience of traumatic events can impact the brain and body. We have chatted about the collective trauma experience during the COVID-19 pandemic, and we made the connection between trauma, violence, and physical activity, and how physical activity may be one approach to help people who have experienced or are experiencing trauma to be present in their bodies and to overcome the constant stress response. So the final piece of the puzzle is the landscape of practice. What is it and how can it be used in the area of trauma and violence informed physical activity? Etienne Wagner, trainer and colleagues define a landscape of practice as multiple groups of people that share a common concern or passion for something and learn how to do it better as they interact and collaborate with one another over time. People in this group learn from each other and improve their knowledge, which in turn creates innovations. These people are creating a social learning space where people can engage, learn from each other, make a difference, and ultimately improve their field. So when we're talking or thinking about the word landscape as a noun, it's all the visible features in an area and how they integrate with one another. It's looking at the trees, mountains, rocks, and waters. Applying this same thought, a landscape of practice is all the people in a subject area and how they integrate with one another. For example, a landscape of practice in the area of elementary school teaching could include teachers, principals, students, parents, guidance counselors, and mental health professionals. There are three key paces that are essential to the success of a landscape of practice. The domain is the shared interest and focus of the group. Our domain is trauma and violence-informed physical activity. The community 
is the different types of people who would benefit from being part of the landscape of practice. Our community intends to be made up of researchers, academics, physical activity professionals, personal trainers, and people with lived and living experience. And the final piece of the puzzle, the practice, is the knowledge, stories, insights, and experiences that the people listed above will bring in and take away from the landscape of practice. So why do we think a trauma and violence-informed physical activity landscape of practice will advance the field? We think it has the potential to improve and create change in physical activity programs to ensure that they are accessible, appropriate, and better suit the needs of the people who use them. And to create a space where all these key players can collaborate, share their experience and knowledge, form connections, and ultimately learn from one another. Including all key players in the landscape of practice is an attempt to ensure that all voices are equally heard. The purpose of this trauma and violence informed landscape of practice is to ensure physical activity is accessible and appropriate for all populations. Our vision is to create a hub for all key players in the area of trauma and violence informed physical activity to engage with one another, collaborate, learn from each other, which in turn creates innovations for programs and resources. To achieve our purpose and mission, we have conducted interviews with experts in the field of trauma and violence informed physical activity to hear their perspectives. We plan to publish a paper of the findings uh, from these interviews and within the next year develop the virtual landscape of practice. I would like to acknowledge and thank my supervisor, Dr. Francine Derrick, and my colleagues who contributed content to this presentation and provided their feedback. My research is supported in part by funding from the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council. Thank you all for attending my presentation and I wish you all the best. Okay, hey, excellent presentation, Elia, I appreciate it. Uh, so now we are opening up um, the Q&A discussion. So we're hoping that you have some questions for Elia. So please feel free uh, to type those into the Q&A box. So Elia, I will, I will start with one just to get things going. What do you see as the greatest barrier to creating a community of practice? That is a great question. Thank you, Francine. So as I mentioned on my last slide, I did interviews with experts in the field of trauma and violence informed physical activity and sport pedagogy. And a major barrier that was mentioned was the power differences that may arise among the members of the landscape of practice. Since we are truly aiming for a landscape of practice made up of various experts and expertise. Okay, that's excellent. Okay, so I have a question here. What are some examples of physical activity that can be trauma and violence informed? Um, so thank you very much for your question. Um, there are a number of researchers trialing uh, trauma and violence informed approaches to various types of physical activity, including walking, boxing, yoga, and basketball, but that is just to name a few of them. Okay, we've got a few more questions coming in here and some congratulations for you. Um, why is it important to have a landscape of practice that is made up of different people? Ooh, okay, thank you for this question. Um, it's really important to create a hub where all these key players in the area of trauma and violence informed physical activity are involved as they each bring in expertise and experience, which is very valuable and also different from one another. Um, we think this diversity in the membership will actually contribute to ensuring that all voices are heard and progress is made within the field. 
Okay, excellent. We have another question here. Great job, Elia. You said you have conducted interviews with experts. I'm curious what some of the main takeaways from the interviews were. Thank you again for your question. Um, so a few of the main takeaways from the interviews included the need for a financial commitment to make sure that the landscape of practice is successful and sustainable. Um, there is also a need for a multi-leveled membership, as I mentioned before, which also comes with power imbalances among the members. Um, and kind of the last main takeaway was that the landscape of practice should be facilitated and structured in a way that abides by trauma and violence informed approaches. Okay, excellent. Um, do we have any more questions? They came in kind of hard and fast and now we've slowed down. <laughs> oh, hold on here. I've got the chat function and a Q&A box. So let's see. Anybody? It's always, it's always awkward when it's a virtual thing and you can't, uh, you can't see people's faces or hands raised. So I, I guess I will take the, take the floor and ask you another question that I hope is um, not too difficult. <laughs> so what are, what are the next steps for you and your research group in actually creating this landscape of practice? Um, so thank you for the question. So as I mentioned, we conducted interviews with experts in the field of trauma and violence informed physical activity. Um, so we are currently working on writing up that manuscript and hoping to publish the manuscript within this next uh, within the next few months. Um, and really the next goal is to start contacting and seeing if individuals would be interested in joining our landscape of practice. Um, again, if anyone is on this call and would like to send me an email, please do so if you are interested and have an expertise or experience. Um, but as I mentioned, we're, we're looking for individuals or a wide range, a diversity of members, um, those with lived and living experience of trauma, researchers in this area. Um, especially physical activity professionals, those that are doing the programming is really of interest to us. And uh, within the next year, we hope to have a virtual, of course, because now in our day and age, uh, a virtual landscape of practice running. Okay, great. Thank you. So somebody has asked, are there any published guidelines for making trauma-informed communities of practice, um, like at a meta level? Thank you very much for your question. Um, so this is quite interesting. There is a lot of literature and published guidelines and advice on creating trauma and violence informed physical activity approaches and more broadly trauma and violence informed approaches, not just for physical activity. And then there's also a lot of literature and advice on how to create um, a successful and a sustainable community of practice. Um, so we are really hoping to lay the groundwork in combining the two of those and to really set up a way to show people, you know, this is how we went about creating a trauma and violence informed physical activity landscape of practice. And um, we hope to disseminate that through our manuscript and, and hopefully to come as our landscape of practice comes together. Okay, excellent. So we have another question here. Um, is a regular exercise routine a good preventative measure to guard against stressful events and trauma? Thank you very much for your question. Um, as I mentioned, my role in the research group is really towards building and developing this landscape of practice. Um, but that is a great question that I would like to take back to our research group. As I did mention, um, regular exercises and physical activity programs um, may result in um, increased negative stress, such as heavy breathing and increased heart rate. And those, in, those experiences of increased negative stress can be potentially triggering to individuals with lived and or living experience of trauma. Um, but if you would like to email me directly, or I could definitely get back to you with a uh, more wholesome response. Okay, excellent. 
Do you feel like there might be practical challenges to creating a community of practice? And if so, how would you try to address these challenges? So for example, if researchers of trauma or trauma-informed practitioners are working full-time, do you think it would be hard for them to find the time and energy to engage in this kind of community? Thank you so much. This is um, something that has come up in our interviews. And the, of course, everybody's time is valuable and everybody has a lot going on right now. And that's why we've shifted our gears also to a, a virtual landscape of practice, um, somewhere kind of a hub, right? Where people can access things when they need to and be part of a discussion when they have the ability to. Um, we're really working in a trauma-informed way. So we would like to invite people to take on as much as they can and as much as their bandwidth would allow. Um, and part of that is recognizing that people's time is you know, busy and, uh, and limited often. So there are definitely challenges, um, but that's also why we're hoping for a diverse group or membership within our landscape of practice. And hopefully it'll balance itself out that individuals will be able to contribute when they have the ability to. Thank you. Okay. So we have somebody who has commented here. That's super Super interesting. The set of good trauma and violence, physical activity, and good landscape of practice. I found a similar gap between research and good data privacy and governance and trauma and violence informed approaches to interactions that collect that data. Thank you very much for that comment. Definitely uh, check out our health and wellness equity research group on Carlton and see where we can align there. <laughs> Yeah, that does actually sound very interesting. Reach out to us. <laughs> okay. So I know I know everyone's busy. Uh, we don't want to keep you any longer than necessary. So for for those people who who need to head off, feel free to um, to log off of the call. Um, for those of you who have additional questions, um, please feel free to reach out to Elia. Um, she is a wealth of information across uh, numerous areas of research. So um, I just, I think I'll, I'll take the opportunity to end it here um, and to say thank you, Elia. Obviously, I'm very invested in this project and passionate about it. Um, but you've done such a phenomenal job in really summarizing um, some, some very complicated areas and bringing it all together. So on behalf of everyone um, who has attended, we want to thank you. And I would also like to thank um, everybody who, who attended and took part in this presentation today. Thank you very much.